days. But I think I feel impressed by the Lord if we can today just to get acquainted a little bit and give you a little bit of maybe uh, the history of this uh, transition, if you will, and uh, a little bit of the state of the, the church and the college and uh, give you just a, just a time to a little folksy, if I can, with you just to, for a few minutes. I'd first like to find out a little bit who I'm speaking with. How many of you are men and women of God who are, you're laymen in the church? You don't necessarily get a paycheck from the church, but you are a layman, you're a mom or a dad or maybe a youth worker, and you're somebody that's here, you, you, you come to support the young people and uh, bring them to youth conference. Would you stand just for a second? If I could have all those men and women. And remain standing if you don't mind. And I just want to, if I want to just say something to you real quickly, I sure thank you for what you do. I know many of you have taken off work and to get here uh, to this meeting, and I'm, I'm just indebted to you. I'll tell you our story. I, I was, uh, I think I told a little bit last night, but uh, um, I was from a very poor uh, family, and, and we did not have a, uh, have lots of money, and the, but a youth conference came up. My dad had come here to a pastor school in 1975, 76, and he loved this place. And our, our youth group decided to, take a, uh, to come here, but we didn't have a full-time youth pastor. And the youth pastor we had had to work, and he couldn't come. And so a man named Mr. Ingleby decided he would drive his own van and bring us down here, about, about uh, probably 10 or 11 of us, and then we stopped in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, picked up a few more people, broke down about two times on the way down here in his van. I mean, we're, we're out beside a bar, trying to, we were parked in by a bar and he was trying to get in there to use a phone. It looked funny, we were making fun of him because he's going to the bar to use the phone. There's no cell phones. And trying to find a car, a car a part he was looking for and stuff of that nature. But uh, then slept on the gym floor the whole week with us and took care of us. And, and let us come to this conference. And when I, when I think about what God did in my heart right up here in this balcony, right here, I sat and just cried like a little, little girl up here. My heart was so crushed. My heart, I just felt like, Lord, what am I supposed to do? I saw the platform fill up with people. Uh, Brother Stuart Mason was standing right over here. At that time, I did not know him. He was a senior in, uh, senior in high school, getting ready to go to the University of Kentucky, and he was standing over here. He didn't even make it to the platform, and I couldn't. I, thought, I saw no sense in me going to the platform. I felt like there's just no way I could ever be, a, be used of the Lord, quite frankly. And I just cried. And Mr. Ingleby, that layman, walked over to me and put his arm around me and said, Son, what's wrong? What's wrong, John? And I remember through, <laughs> I was just heaving. And he said, he said, what's the matter? I said, I, I think I'm supposed to tell God I'll do whatever he wants me to do. I'm supposed to surrender myself to the Lord. And he goes, well, do it. <laughs> There was no Nike theme at that time, but he could have said, just do it. He said, do it. Just be garbage at God's disposal, John. I said, hey, okay. You know, and and uh, he put his arm around me. He knelt down with me on the, on the last row, the last seat right there next to the middle section there, and he, he prayed with me. And I've never, I've never thought of layman the same. Never thought of just church workers. In that, he wasn't a youth pastor. He didn't go to a youth group. He just drove a van and loved the kids that were there. And for all of you, I thank you for doing that for your young people. Thank you. you may be seated. I'm so thankful for you. Each of you. Appreciate it very much. Then how about uh, youth pastors? you got youth pastors that are here. Would you stand real quickly yeah. if I can? Thank God for youth pastors. My, uh, my, I was with my brother. Two of my brothers are here today. Mark and Luke, would you guys stand real quickly? Uh, I always kind of joke with people, but this is my brother Mark and Luke, and I have another brother I saw on Monday in Dallas, Texas. His name is Matt. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We have two sisters, Axe and Romans. I'm just joking about that. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, uh, we have two sisters. They have really normal names, Jan and Mary. But uh, you know, we, we kind of always joke with them about that. But uh, I was sitting with my brother today. He was telling me, he said, John, you know, we were, we, my dad, he had happy feet, so he just moved a lot, you know, and for no apparent reason. He'd say, you know, we're going to move. I said, when, Dad? Tomorrow. <laughs> it was just, it moved every time the rent came due. It just seemed like, you know, whenever it came. And uh, my dad, my, my brother said to me, he said, John, he said, in those teenage years when we were moving, you know, like gypsies, uh, different places, 
He said one thing that was really a blessing is that God, my dad put us in churches that had good youth pastors. Amen. And the youth pastors loved us and gave us stability where at the, sometimes it wasn't that easy to move to a new place. And I thank you men for coming. God bless you. Thank you for what you do for the Lord as well. And I appreciate you. How about pastors? Thank you men. You may be seated. How about pastors? Would you stand? This is a great group right here. Thank you so very much, man. I never thought I would ever be a pastor. I'll, I'll tell you my story in a moment, but I never thought I would ever be a pastor. But I've always loved pastors, and I've always appreciated what men of God do for, uh, for the work of God. But I never really came to that understanding until one day I was one. And I realized the load that you carry, you know, your family, your, your, the finances of the church, is always difficult the problems of the people. You know, a, a pastor is a very special person because no one says call doctor, call policeman, call nurse. They always say call the, call the. But when it comes to pastor, you call pastor. It's like your first name. It's a position very unique. Uh, they don't say call mayor. They say call the mayor. But people say call pastor. Amen. And because you, you play a very special role in the lives of people, and at no small sacrifice. And then for those ladies who are married to a pastor, I cannot, I think sometimes the lamb that needs a shepherd most of all lives under his roof. And, uh, but ladies, thank you for what you do for your men and for that. And I thank you for having the vision to bring your kids to a place like this. And I really will hope to get to know every one of you. I hope that you will not. We'll be very accessible. All of our speakers will we'll eat together here in a few minutes. If you have a question for something we do to help you, I want to do that. My wife will, will also join us at several venues, and, and uh, sometimes it's difficult for her to get places. There's eight reasons she can't, and they all have names. <laughs> so <laughs> difficult to do that, but uh, she, she loves pastor's wives, and, and uh, she's a great pastor's wife. And, but I thank you, men, for serving the Lord. And ladies, thanks for serving with your men, and thank you for the burdens you carry. Thank you for punching holes in the dark where you are, and uh, you're doing a great work, and don't come down came here on fire, that's wonderful. If you came here a little discouraged, thanks for coming. Thanks for taking time. And I know some of you had breakdowns in your credit card. And you're thinking, oh, brother, here we go. You know, I've got this problem. I didn't expect this. This kid didn't bring me money and all that stuff that you've got. <laughs> and, uh, but thank you for coming. Appreciate that. You may be seated. And thank you, all of you, for being with us. We sure love you. Appreciate your coming. Of course, this place has a great history, 125 years here in Hammond, Indiana, and, and uh, God used a, a man to come here in a miraculous way to start this church. Many years ago, I had the joy of listening to Brother Keith McKinney tell the story in my early days as, as a pastor, and uh, I feel so honored to be a part of what God has done here. I feel very humbled, and uh, I've said this publicly oftentimes, I feel like a turtle on a fence post. If you ever see a turtle on the fence post, you know one thing, someone put him there. <laughs> he did not <laughs> climb up there himself. You know? And I feel very much that way as the pastor of this church. You know, I did not climb up to this opportunity. It was certainly a divine appointment. It was something, not something I, I, I tried to get, something I wanted to be. I thought I never would. This is just something that the Lord put me in for this time. And my casket could be in town today, I don't know, and maybe something I'll just do for a few weeks or a few months or a few years or maybe a few decades, but I'm very honored to be a part of what God is doing, and I'm very thankful for this wonderful church and uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here. I was saved as a young man uh, in a Sunday night service is where I heard the gospel for the very, I've heard it my whole life, but I was in, in elementary school, and man, that Sunday night, God rattled my cage. I went out to the car, I got in the car, and my family wasn't there yet, I just sat in there and waited until my mom and dad and my siblings got in the car. I rode home, I got, I got in, my, uh, in my bed clothes, and I, went, I tried to go to sleep. I counted sheep, cows, goats, everything you can count, trying to get the conviction away from my heart. And finally, um, I, I don't know what time it was, I, but I do believe it was probably after midnight. I didn't seem like I just, I'd laid there for hours. And finally, I woke up, or I didn't wake up, but I woke my parents up. I knocked on the door, and my parents said, what's the matter, John? Are you sick? I said, no, I'm not sick, but I'm also not saved. I need to get saved. And they said, well, they turned the light on. They woke up. They got the Bible out and shared the gospel with me that Monday morning, I believe. 
and I got saved. I'm so thankful for mom and dad who, who uh, exposed me to the gospel early in my life. And then I came here to a youth conference in 1980 and, and enjoyed a week of, of youth conference here, and this place was bigger than life. I could not believe that this many people uh, could, could gather, and it was fun, it was enjoyable, the decorations, so you want to be a star, or walk through a tunnel, get into the registration line, and I thought, this is amazing. Even the box lunches tasted good. Everything was, I just couldn't believe it. Went out to the college, I couldn't believe the college, and, but I was a starry-eyed eighth grader, you know, and trying to figure out things until, of course, the Lord called me, or I surrendered. I, I knew that I was saved, and I had God, but I didn't realize that God didn't have me. I needed to surrender myself to the Lord, so I did that here in this building right up there as I shared with you, and then went through high school, and then uh, in 1985, I enrolled here at Hiles Anderson College, and I was at that time, we were living in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and I came here to school and, and had the wonderful joy of graduating in 1989, met Linda in my uh, sophomore year. And she was from Massachusetts, and I'm from Tennessee, and, and uh, from, that's where my father's from, and that's where we kind of hail from. And so I uh, uh, finished school. I was getting ready to, I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do, and then Brother Ray Young asked me to uh, consider teaching at City Baptist, which is our bus kids school. And so I began teaching fifth and sixth grade here. By the way, I mentioned Brother Ray. Brother Ray just now recently, I mean, this came in, I think, day before yesterday, Monday, these arrived. They're... I, I, I haven't read the entire, all the letters, but I did read the, the part of the, the first draft of this before it went to the publishers. But it's Dr. Jack Hiles, uh, A Lifetime in Letters. And uh, Brother Ray, why don't you just real quickly take this microphone, just stand in here and just, to just introduce this. I, I think, I love Brother Hiles, and I, and I walk in the shadow, and you know, someone says, you've got some big shoes to fill. Let me tell you, I'm not going to try to fill anybody's shoes. I'll hang them up on the wall and let's admire them, but I got to fill my own shoes, you know, and, and walk by them and appreciate what God has done. But, but the more I get to know Brother Hiles and his ministry, and of course in college you admired him, but you, we didn't, we, most of us were not close to him. You may have seen him one or two times in your entire life first in, in personally. But for me, that was my story. But the more I get to know about him and, and the, the more I admire his ministry, but uh, talk a little bit about that real quickly, would you? I think it'd be advantageous to folks. About a year before Brother Hiles died, uh, he agreed to give me his entire correspondence file. He had stored every letter I assumed that he ever wrote all the way back to when he was in college, 1948. Even handwritten letters to his mother, he had copies of, of some of those. There were 89 storage boxes filled with these files and so I did a little math and there was somewhere over 55,000 letters in his correspondence files so for the last 13 years I've been going through those 55,000 letters I've looked at just about every one of them I haven't read every letter every word but I've read a portion of just about every one of them he had them filed by last name, alphabetically by last name. But when I went through the 55,000 letters, I chose the ones that I thought might fit into the project I was working on. And I put them in, I put them in chronological order. And so when I finished going through, I was shocked to, to find that I had, over a period of six years, I had chosen uh, over 15,000 letters to consider putting in the project. And uh, now, finally, we've uh, finished volume one, and the letters are in chronological order, beginning with a letter he wrote to his mother when he was in college, and going through 1959. The, the first volume is, we call it the Texas years, because that's the years he was in Texas. Volume two is uh, about 85% finished. I hope to have it out by the end of the year. And it's gonna be the first 10 years that Brother House was here in uh, Hammond. The letters are mainly letters that Brother Hiles wrote to people like John R. Rice, Lester Roloff, Joe Boyd, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But many of the letters are letters that these men wrote to Brother Hiles also. Uh, prob dozens and dozens of them are that. They're very interesting to see how the, the, he corresponded with all these men, but it's more than just interesting. There's just scores and scores and scores, hundreds 
uh, very, very valuable lessons. It's almost like a, uh, like a Howe's Church Manual too, like a second version of the Howe's Church Manual. It's almost like Brother Howe's kept a daily journal. When you put all the letters he wrote in chronological order, he dictated letters literally every day. 55,000 letters, 51 years in the ministry. Do the math, that's over 1,000 letters a year. It's about three letters a day. He, he, it was almost as if he kept a daily journal. And uh, so I think you'll enjoy it, but I think you'll also benefit from it a great deal. Thank you, Brother. Thank you for taking the time to share that with us. I, I, I do think it's a, you know, and I don't know what your interests are, but I tell you, you can see when you start reading letters from Brother Dr. Bob Jones Sr. to him and Myron Cedar home and Lester Roloff, back before there was a First Baptist Church of Hammond that we know today in these early years, and he would just tell about, oh, we had this many saved yesterday, and then Bob Jones you know, Sr. would want him to preach at a certain meeting, and he couldn't fit it into his schedule. Of course, Bob Jones Sr. was an evangelist, and he was a pastor, and they would correspond. Just a lot of fun to enjoy to read that. But when I think about Brother Hiles' ministry here, just a, I was amazed that I had the opportunity to be in the same ministry with him. I taught in, I taught in, in, in City Baptist, and then God made it very obvious that to, to uh, a pastor in California, Larry Chapel was his name, and he pastored the First Baptist Church of Long Beach, and he was out here teaching a, a, a week at the summer school session for Hiles Anderson College, and he contacted me, he said, I've been in con correspondence with Brother Hiles, and uh, he told me I could talk with you and want to talk to you about possibly serving in California. Now, when I was a, a young man out in Tennessee, I had not been really west of uh, of Texas there, so the thought of going to California was the last thing on my mind. I remember walking around the lake with Linda before she was even my girlfriend. Uh, officially, she said, you know, she was in Miss Weaver's class. Miss Weaver said, you need to find out what your, your guy you're dating is going to do. And she said, what are you going to do? And like, what do you expect yourself to be doing in 10 years? And I said, I don't know. Whatever it is, it won't be in California, you know, and a bunch of weirdos out there, you know. And, <laughs> And uh, sure enough, I spent 16 years in California and became one of those weirdos, you know. And, and, uh, but I loved it. But anyway, the Lord led us to go to California, and I taught school for three years there in junior high and high school. And that's where, you know, of course, met so many sweet, sweet friends and enjoyed ministry there with Brother Chapel and also his son, Mark. And then the Lord uh, moved us to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, became a school principal for seven years at, uh, at the Calvary Christian School in, in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana under the leadership of uh, Dr. Larry Spencer was his name, and uh, just enjoyed serving God there so very much, and, and uh, just uh, thought I, I, I had took a pastoral assistance major in college. I remember being in the, in the, in the uh, registration line, and I just didn't know when I was the oldest in my family. I didn't know exactly how to do all those college things, and, I, and I, my parents, I just drove up here with another man, and I rode up with another guy, so my parents weren't here, and and then I needed more money than I had to get everything done. They didn't tell me about the insurance I had to buy for myself. And so I was like, I was all stressed out. But I was in the registration line, and I was standing there, and, and, and they said, what major do you want? And I said, I heard them asking the people in front of me what major they want to have. I said, man, they're going to ask me that question. So I asked the guy, I said, what you, what's your major? He said, pastoral theology. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? He said, that means you're going to be a pastor. I said, oh, good night. What are you going to do? And I asked that guy over here. <laughs> He said, I'm going to be, Brother Hiles says, if you don't know what to do, take secondary ed and be a teacher. I said, well, that's a good idea. He said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to be a pastoral assistant major. I'm going to, and, and that way I can, I'm not going to be a pastor, but I can help a pastor. I said, now, that's what I'd like to do. And then they said, you're going to get three areas of like a minor or a concentration. You can do music, youth, or education. And I, so I, I put my, my, my little two and two. I said, this guy's secondary ed, Brother Hiles education, assistant pastor, maybe I'll learn how to teach a Bible class or something or what have you. So I said, I want to be a pastoral assistant. He said, it's even better because you don't have to take Greek. I said, oh man, that's great. So, so anyway, that's what I did. And, and with the mindset that I would never be a pastor, but I wanted to help a pastor. I love pastors. And so that was my thought. And, and so, but I began teaching school and I taught school and I got a master's degree and, and while I was in administration and and began to administrate in school and things of that nature. I was grading English papers on April the uh, 18th in 2000, and I was grading some English papers for my high school senior and junior uh, English class, and I got a call from Long Beach, California, and it was the church I had served in for seven years prior to that, and they had lost their pastor in 1999, and they said it was the head deacon, and I knew him, he was my friend, he was the bus driver for Linda, Linda was a bus 
bus captain, has been a bus captain until I moved here uh, just a few, a few months ago. And so there was a bus driver, and he said, hey, Brother John, this is Bob Egg. I said, oh, how you doing, Brother Bob? And I was asking all kinds of questions. I said, now, who, who's y'all's pastor? He goes, well, we haven't found a pastor yet. Oh, I said, good. I got a couple guys you might want to consider. You know, and I started giving him a couple names, and he said, well, John, we don't really want the, your, your recommendation. We want you to consider being pastor. I said, oh, no, no. I can never be a pastor. There's no way. Now, I had preached about seven times in my entire life in a church service at that point. And, um, but uh, four of those times, I threw up. <laughs> the day I was, you know, I went on vacation to see my grandmother. My grandmother called the pastor and said, oh, my son's a Bible college student, you know, and Maybe you could preach on Wednesday night. I said, Grandmother, you're ruining my whole vacation. <laughs> Don't do that, you know. And one time I was driving through an area, and me and Dale Breed were together in, in Lafayette, Tennessee, and at a toilet, and, and we were there, and we pulled into a church to go, go to church, and we're standing in the back. And of course, we got shirts and ties on. It's a country church, and, and the pastor, they're singing songs. And what you guys do? And oh, we're Bible college students. We're just passing through going to church. And I go, oh, great. Y'all come testify. I said, oh. oh. So we go up there and testify. Dale gives a testimony. I give a testimony. The pastor said, let's sing another song. He said, comes up to me and says, I feel led of the Lord to ask you to preach. <laughs> I said, brother, the Lord didn't tell me that. <laughs> he goes, oh, brother, we got to have you do that. Now, that'd be great, you know. And I said, you got to sing a few more songs because I don't know. <laughs> And I said, Dale, what about you? Said, Don't you put that on me. You know? And so, you know, I went through and found a sermon that Brother, Brother Scott had preached in chapel. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll try this one, you know. And got up there, and they let us stand in the back, gave us $37 to boot. And we took off down the road. And, and uh, I was too scared to get sick that time, you know. But uh, I just thought, boy, I, just, I, I love preaching. I love to see my pastor preach. And I love to hear and preach, but I just thought, there's no way in the world, how does a pastor come up with three messages every week, you know, not to mention Sunday school classes and funerals and weddings and Christian school chapels and all the things that go with that. I just thought, that's overwhelming, and uh, especially when being exposed to pe hearing people like Brother Hiles and Brother Ray and Brother Lapina and those guys that just could preach the, the paint off the walls, you know, and I just, just thought, that's, that's awesome. There's no way I could do that. Anyway, to make a long story short, a few weeks later, I became the pastor of First Baptist of Long Beach in really miraculous form. I went there. The church had uh, gone through the most difficult year of its, of its, of its 118-year history. Uh, they had lost their pastor two times, and the last two pastors to immorality and some difficulties there, and finance, financial burdens were heavy. There were about 100 English-speaking people. It's a downtown inner-city church in Long Beach. There was about 100 English people left and about 600 Spanish and, and about 40 Korean uh, believers that were there meeting in the facility. And um, a lot of difficulties and heartaches. And yet I was 32 and, and uh, they were willing to work with me. And we just kind of went through this, the, the difficulties of that, of that rebuilding process. I remember going to my desk and there were $900,000 worth of bills. <laughs> uh, there was just leases and, and all kinds of different things that that took me, took me li literally about, about a month to get a hold of every creditor and tell them we're new, we'll work with you. If you work with us, we'll pay the bills. And we, were, we had 58 missionaries, and, and we had, uh, there were three months behind supporting them. It was June 9th when I came, and we hadn't paid March's missionaries yet. And people, and several voicemails saying, are you, you guys drop us, or what's going on? And, uh, but God really just took a mess and made a miracle. Uh, in many ways, and it became very, a very special, special church through soul winning, through the things I learned in this place, and, and through discipling converts. We were able to disciple uh, 700 adults through uh, at least four lessons, and, and probably of that 700, about 400 went through 16 lessons of discipleship and became very strong uh, uh, Christians that today are still functioning and God's blessing them and using them in a special way and enjoyed a wonderful ministry there for, for those years. But, uh, and I thought I would live the rest of my life in Long Beach, California. I loved it there. And, I, and uh, just speaking about it really, it, it strums uh, emotions in my heart that I, I, really, I really love that church. I love the people there. But uh, this December, of course, uh, last year, when it was actually this week when Brother Scott stepped down as the pastor and uh, they had been through a difficult time. All of us who heard that 
grieved and prayed and sought the Lord that God would help this church. And, but um, it was just one of those things that we just prayed about and, and we wanted God to bless them and not even at all thinking that, uh, that would, I would ever be um, asked to be here. But in December, I was at my desk on a Monday morning and uh, was, um, had my cell phone. My cell phone was on my desk. I was writing visitor letters to the visitors who had come that day. And I usually had a form letter and I wrote a personal note on each visitor letter. And, and so I was writing those letters and I saw my, my phone uh, begin to vibrate. I looked over there and it just had a little text message. This is Terry Duff. The, uh, the chairman of the deacons at First Baptist Church of Ham, and I'm requesting a private conversation with you um, this morning, if at all possible. It was Monday morning. I saw that on my phone, and I thought to myself, no, Lord. I don't, I, you know, I, I just, not because I did not want to come to Hammond, it's because I did not want to leave the church family that God had placed me in there. And, and I just... I texted him back, and I said, you know, uh, this was about 8.30 in the morning, so I just said uh, about 10.15. And I finished a few work there, went out and got my car, and went to a place that I'd oftentimes pray and study the scriptures. And I'd sit in my car and put my Bible on my steering wheel and, and uh, pray and read the Bible and prepare for messages and put a back stack of books in my, in my car. And, and, uh, but I, I went out to that place and sat there and waited till 10.15, and then the call came. Brother Duff began to explain a little bit about what had happened here. And uh, he said, well, he said, we, we don't really know what we're doing, but we, we worked very hard to seek the Lord. We fasted and prayed. And we started with 48 men on a list that were submitted to us. And one by one, we've been able to go through that. He said, two weeks ago, you had a man in your church that was visiting your church. And he was one of our deacons, one of our pulpit committee men. And um, he said, um, we've had him there. We've had some other men at other churches, but uh, last night we met him unanimously, met with our deacons, and uh, everybody thinks that we believe that you're God's man for this church. We'd like to know if you would consider uh, coming a candidate. At that moment, of course, my heart was overwhelmed, and I just thought to myself, Lord, I don't want to say yes, but I can't say no. If you open this door, then maybe I need to consider it. And that's what I told Brother Duff. I said, Brother Duff, I, I, I don't want to be unkind to you, but I, I have no desire to be the pastor of First Baptist Church of Ham. I've had the desire my entire, since I was became a pastor the first time, 12 and a half years ago, to be the pastor of the precious people of First Baptist Church of Long Beach. And so I don't want to tell you yes, but I don't think the Spirit of God will let me tell you no. So I guess I just need to do whatever you tell me to do. What is the next step? And then, of course, it was to candidate. And then God gave liberty for us to come. We moved here on February the 12th of this year. And we came into a place where there's some of the sweetest Christians you'll ever meet gather every week. And salt of the earth people. From the average guy who works in the steel mill out here to the men who serve in the staff, the college, the high schools, the radio station, the cemetery. They're just unbelievable, wonderful people. And I love them very much and very grateful to be here, to be with them. I don't, um, as, um, as you can understand, it's certainly there are hurting people. There's been a lot of difficulty, a lot of hurt, a lot of difficult. But in, uh, in when Brother Hiles went to heaven, there were 37 church employees. Uh, when, at the height of Brother, Ch uh, Brother, uh, excuse me, Brother uh, Scott's ministry, there were 155 church employees. And the church grew. Of course, a beautiful building was built, offices, structure, things of that nature. Um, but then over the last several years, a lot of layoffs have had to take place. And that's been very hurtful to the people of the church. And, and because it, if it doesn't hurt for the person who got laid off, it hurts their, their, their wife, their husband, their children. Not that they can't make more money and better money someplace else. It just feels like you weren't valued. You were chosen. You weren't. You weren't chosen. You weren't worth keeping. And those are some very difficult, difficult uh, emotions to feel. But uh, nonetheless, the Lord has been very gracious, and God has chosen to bless. Uh, I do believe the emphasis has got to be on First Baptist Church of Hammond, and uh, that's where that's where the this is the greatness of this ministry is not Hiles Anderson College. It is. First Baptist Church of Ham. 
the greatness of the ministry is not a radio station. It is the First Baptist Church of Hammond. It's not anything else we do. It is the, it is the church of God, and we've heard this from Brother Hiles' lips. It gives divine perpetuity. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so our emphasis has been to work with our church family and to, to love them, and let's, let's learn how to be soul winners again. Let's learn how to disciple converts. Let's, let's, let's learn how to reach our area, and starting with our Jerusalem, Hammond, and working out. And uh, I chose to move to Hammond. I live in Hammond, about three minutes away from the church here, and uh, our family is here. We've had probably over 200 people in our home since we've become the pastor here, and different venues, and maybe about 300 now. Sunday afternoons, we'll have people come over to our house. We've had several people saved in our home after unsaved people have come. We've led them to Christ in our home, gotten baptized here. Um, we use our home as a, as a hospitality center to, to do that, and, and God has used that, that ministry. I found our staff to be second to none, wonderful, godly, hardworking, organized people. They're working very, very hard, have been very, very faithful. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, there's a lot of trials, a lot of difficulties. We still have some areas that uh, legally we we're having to face uh, because of the fallout there. But every day I enjoy ministry that Brother Hiles and Brother Scott did uh, as they were led by the Spirit of God. And I have, I have been given a great gift to be here. And Brother Scott, God used him tremendously in our ministry. The last two years, obviously, there were struggles for him. And it was very difficult on him, difficult on his wife, difficult on his children. But uh, I thank God that there is grace. And uh, wherever sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And uh, I've been, I've communicated with Brother Scott by letters and, and his family with frequency. And they're, 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 it's a very difficult, I don't know what it's like to be them. But we love them. We're very grateful that God has given us a chance to serve the Lord together at this time. We're praying for them. But we also have to deal with the fallout of the difficulties on a daily basis, and yet God has given grace to do that. God has sustained us. We've seen people save in the church. We've God has seen us meet our needs. It is, we feel like we live on a banana peel every day, but uh, at the same time, God's been very gracious and been good, and people have given. And our missions giving is, is, is at record giving, and that's a, I think that's a, something that always needs to be emphasized. I think if you get a heart for God's world, he'll get a heart for your little world, you know? Uh, go ye into all the world. I think if we get a world evangelistic focus, then God gets excited. I think that Philippians 4.19 is that, that verse there where it says, but my God shall supply all your needs. And we have a lot more needs here than just money. <laughs> and so we need God's help. And I believe that the way to do that is to, is to focus on world evangelism. And so God has blessed our church. Uh, Sunday, Sundays, yeah, week after week, people have learned to give to missions and he let us let they let us make march that emphasis on world evangelism, and I believe God has met our needs because of that. But then we have to move to the college. Obviously, the college has uh, uh, has been hurt numerically by this particular incident of last year and over the last several years. But God has really been good to the school. Amen. It's been wonderful. And, and this week, I, I sat with Brother Eddie Lapina and Brother Mason and. Brother Mason began to weep as he began to think about all that God has done for us as a college and how he sustained us and helped us. And you see these young people sing. You're going to hear the guys sing a little bit. Man, I'm telling you what, that, is, that moves me. And they're, they're not just, you know, they're not showmen. These, people, these, these kids are special, special young people, and they're servants of God. They're young servants of God. And what we're trying to do in the college primarily is to attract the attention of God who loves us. And so give him an opportunity to show himself strong. You know, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. On behalf of him whose heart is perfect toward him. And, uh, but we've seen God do some sweet things. We're excited about the future of the school. Several things I want to emphasize. I'll just tell you this quickly. I know my time is going on and, and you've listened well. But uh, let me just uh, tell you a few things as far as the school. Since you... Uh, by the way, how many are graduates of Howells Anderson College or you attended here? Would you raise your hand? Oh, my goodness. So this is ought to have interest to all of you. And, um, and I thank the Lord for so many things that have taken place at the school. But there are a few things I feel like that we need to, to adjust a little bit so that we can uh, 
do what we ought to do. I don't think we're, we're not a liberal arts college. We're a college that was founded by Brother Hiles, and Brother, Brother Hiles is walking out in Pomona, California. I know, right, I know right the road where he was walking, the area that he was walking. I've been there numerous times when God impressed his heart to, call, to start a Hiles Anderson College. And I've been on the phone with Brother Russell Anderson many, many hours since I've been the pastor, and he has talked about, I said, tell me about how it happened. He goes, yeah, Brother Hiles is out there, and he called me, and we've been friends, and I believe in him, and he and Brother Rice, I'd go to conferences wherever I could go to hear those two preach, and he asked me if I would be interested in helping him start a college, and, and uh, he had the money, obviously, to give the first investment, and, and uh, participated in that, but he did that so he could, he could train God's servants for full-time Christian ministry. That is basically, we need to find out what we're good at and try to do that. That, that we're not we're not here to 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 train nurses at the present time. It's not we're not here to, to to train marketing majors or things of that nature. We're here to train God's servants for church and missions, and uh, that's our our purpose. And we've got to go back to make sure we understand that that's the case. But there's several things I think that could be helpful to us, and in regards to that, and part of that is um, just remember our history and. Another thing we want to do and for, our, for our young men is I want, I'd like to every young man to take church ed every year. Amen. And kind of scale back church ed a little bit for freshmen and sophomores, a few juniors and seniors in there. But I believe, and by the way, when I was in, when I was in college, I hated church ed. <laughs> I didn't like it, man. I thought, man, how come we have to do this four years in a row, you know? And I, I didn't like it until I became a pastor. And then it became very important that I took church ed. And I... I got out my church ed notes and saw myself scribbling. I'd write away and all of a sudden go like that, you know. And saw drool marks on my funerals and things of that nature. And, and, uh, and I remember real quick, I said, man, I got I to gotta figure this out here. I need to know that. And boy, that helped me so much to, do, to learn how to do a wedding, to do a funeral, to do things that pastors organize budgets and things of that nature. And I remember with such a... Vividness. If I'd taken it one semester or one year, I would have forgot. I wouldn't even. It wouldn't even matter to me because I got the key to repetition. The key to learning is repetition, going through it. And so I've asked Brother Ray Young to begin to oversee uh, church ed again, and Amen. to do that. And he's going to oversee the church ed program. We'll have guest speakers come in that will speak on a weekly basis. We have one guest speaker every week. We'll spend about thirty-five thousand dollars to to bring guest speakers and pastors who are in the trenches. I believe pastors are best at training pastors. And so we're going to try to get some pastors here to help do that. I've given uh, one day of our week here, and I'll be at the college every day, every week for one day. Um, we, on this fall semester on Tuesdays, and after that probably on Thursdays will work better for our schedule. And I'll go out there and teach all the freshmen spiritual leadership and 21st century missions in the, fall, in the spring semesters. And then also we'll be teaching church ed that day, being chapel. Don't necessarily have to speak for chapel every time, but, but it will be out there uh, spending the day with the students, eating lunch with them, those kind of things. I, I, love, I love the young people. And, and I did not choose to be a college teacher, but, but about two years after I became a pastor in Long Beach, I got asked to teach at Pacific Baptist College in Pomona. I taught there for seven and a half years and then began to teach in six and a half years for Golden State Baptist College for the Jack Trieber School. I would take an airline flight every, every Tuesday or Thursday morning at 6 o'clock, fly up there, teach five hours, and come back in the afternoon. And I did that for six and a half years, uh, teaching in that college. I taught modular uh, classes there at West Coast Baptist College. And we had a Bible Institute with 130, 140 people who took classes Monday and Tuesday nights at our church there in Long Beach. So I'm, I'm not, I don't know exactly how to administrate the school, but I've been with them for a while, teaching them. And, I'm very excited, and I'm very comfortable teaching young people and, and uh, being with them, and I'm very grateful for that. And then we're going to be moving our staff out there, much of our, our church staff. Uh, over the last several years, it was decided that our church staff did not need to teach at the college. But to me, when I went to school, it was cool for me to see Brother Jeff Owens come out there and teach a class, and see Brother Ed Lapina teach a class, and Brother Ray Young, who had just been with Brother Hiles, and, 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 and they've been in staff meetings. They were coming out telling what he said in this meeting and, and who they led to Christ and what happened on the buses, what happened in the youth ministry. And, and so I felt like that, that those were strong things that, that really impacted me. So I felt like we need to bring our staff out to the college at least one day a week throughout the week to teach different classes, be it Bible, like Brother Freddie Deanna is going to teach Acts, and Brother 
Roy Moffat, what a great soul winner. He's going to teach personal soul winning. And every week, Brother Moffat leads people to Christ, has people baptized, disciples, converts. And, and I think it would be best for them to be people on the front lines doing that, not just to, nothing wrong with resident professors. We need people who are with the students and, and can be there all the, the whole time, the full-time employees. But I like the idea of having the church influence back on the college. And so we're going to do that. And then I want to work on regards to a little bit toward media. You heard last night, too, the men who work on us, Brother, Brother John Sue, and uh, he's a very gifted young man who was raised in Brooklyn, New York, and, and is Korean descent, but, but God has given him great aptitude for that. And then Brother Eddie Wilson, um, Brother Isaac Rubio, Brother Tim, Tim Silver, and others are going to help our young people. Because we believe, I believe God uses four things to get the world the gospel, men, materials, money, and media. And I think uh, media is an area we can't ignore. We're not going to be, it's not going to be our, our main focus. But I would like for young people to understand a little bit how to, uh, how to maybe put up work or manage a, a, a website for a church, to put up something to make something a podcast or those kind of things. And so we put some emphasis in regards to that. And then we want to really work hard on missions. I believe that if there's ever a time to strike, the, you know, 94% of the world's population lives outside of America. 6% of the world lives in our country. 94% lives somewhere else. And I think that the, the, the time has gone by, and we have opportunities today we do not have. The world's a lot smaller. We can travel a lot quicker. We can do, I think, much more for the cause of world event. And this is something I thank the Lord, the Pastor Scott. God used Brother Scott in a wonderful way to really catapult our church family into missions. We love team missions, but that's not the only way to do missions. But at the same time, training young people, preparing them uh, for a life of service wherever God wants them to do, whether it be short term, long term, but uh, when you start talking about people, talking to people like Brother Rick Martin, Brother Kevin Wynn, Brother uh, Sigstad, Brother Lane Jones, uh, Mark Holmes, so many of these people, God has used them greatly, Brother Mark Bachman, um, and these are great men of God, and yet they've given their lives and their families have done the same thing to, to the world, and I think we, we, need to, we need an emphasis on that and, uh, and, and staying faithful to the ministry. And then ministering, and we want to get the young people in the field. And one thing I think we have at Housing Engineering College is a little bit of a special force. We have Chicago. We have the bus ministry. We have the opportunity for them to get to the field within minutes and not run out of people anytime soon. And it's beautiful to see these young people behind me and people like them bringing converts down the aisle on Sunday night and Sunday morning and letting them do while they, they learn the classroom, but they're able to do something in the ministry. But we need the Lord's help desperately. We need prayer. We need finances. We need wisdom. And I want to just thank you so much for coming. But I felt like I just wanted to take this time, and I've taken longer than I, I wanted to, to speak to you about this. But I'm very thankful. Uh, for you. We're glad you're here. If you have questions while you're here or things or concerns or ideas or things you think that would be helpful to us, we're all ears, okay? We want to hear from you. We're, we're glad that um, it, is a, it is a first bat. I think one of the most things about I love about Howells Anderson College is what it says when you arrive out on the campus today, you'll see Howells Anderson College, and underneath it, it says a ministry of First Baptist Church. It is a church college, but because of you and because of the the 8,000 people like us who graduated from here, who went to school here, it, it, it's a part of you too. And we want to have your input. We want to have things that will be helpful to you. And if you want to talk to Brother Mason, you want to talk to Brother Ray, myself, anybody, we can be a help to you. We want to do that. We're looking forward to serving the Lord with you. And I thank you so much for giving this time to get just a little bit connected about some of those things. Let's pray and we'll, we'll